I'm, uh, I'm from Canada. <laughs> uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, inclusive user experiences and how we're responsible for building them as the people who work on, on software and digital products today in any capacity. Uh, so I only have 20, min 20 minutes and thanks to my update here, a little bit less, so let's dive right in. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about what this is, why it's important, uh, and why it's complicated. And I think that the biggest problem with like quote unquote inclusion sometimes is that we throw the term around a lot, but we fail to do what we're good at as technologists, and that is define it uh, for whatever reason. So let's try and do that a little bit. Let's break it down. Um, UX is the journey and the perception of the, pe the people using your product, right? It's their satisfaction and their ability to do what they need to get done within that product, right? It's the inclusive part that's a little bit harder to pin down, um, especially as it relates to design and code, but it doesn't need to be. Um, inclusion needs to actually happen before the user can get to try and complete that task. Um, and this is something that I want to make sure we understand. Uh, inclusive can mean for everyone, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, and you'll see kind of what I mean as we go here. Um, and oddly enough, the, the dictionary definition for inclusive is an oppositional one. Uh, and that means it means to not exclude people, right? Um, and it's a bit vague, but the involved in something there is important as well. And when we think about code, we don't always think about things like communities. We may not, yeah, it may, you know, code, it doesn't bring, to bring that to mind for everyone, but a community is just common ownership and shared interest. It's being, as we saw in the last slide, it's being involved in something. And this isn't just about design and development, but about us as creators of things and our users, the people for whom we create. And we use a product because it should help us do something, and we all share in that accomplishment, be it you know, fitness, discussion, code, what, whatever that something is. Products are communities by default because they bring groups of people together. Um, they, again, involve them in something. Um, and when we particularly love a piece of software or a product, we find ourselves saying things like, you know, I am an X user rather than I use X product. Um, and it means that we identify with that product so strongly that it becomes part of us. It becomes part of the way we think about ourselves. And so we care a lot about being included in these communities. And so code and design in that respect then are critical because they enable and govern these interactions. They make them possible or not possible, as the case may be. They can allow people to get things done and make connections, but they also allow us in some contexts to be pretty terrible to each other. Um, and we, as the people working on these things, build experiences that are inclusive or not. Um, and we can exclude because, as the title of my talk says, they're not neutral. Um, they invite people to participate and they leave people out. This is the topic of my talk, right? Algorithms these days are highly discussed and people think that, you know, they equate them with neutrality because they're code, they're a rule set, right? The, but they're not, they're just a set of rules that govern user experience, but who writes those rules? <laughs> we do. We write the code, we make the designs, we, you know, a design that I create can govern the code to be written as well. And we're fallible people, right? And as a result, products built with these rule sets can exclude other, others. Um, and I think that a fun sort of exercise to see what makes for an inclusive experience is to see, and therefore how to approach building one, is actually to approach it in one of the internet's favorite ways, and that is by looking at some comprehensive fails of that. Um, so starting with this one, uh, Apple's health kit uh, shipped originally without the ability to track reproductive health data, excluding a good chunk of the population. Um, and it took a year to include that. Um, but 
don't worry about it, though. You could track your selenium intake before you could track your reproductive health. Um, this, there's a gym in the UK a while back that didn't allow uh, Dr. Louise Selby uh, to go for a workout. She couldn't enter the women's change room because the security system was created and built such that it only associated the title of doctor with males. Um, I have a quick video for this one. I'm not sure if anyone's seen this. Um, how do, oh God, how do, no. 11. Could you please repeat that? 11. 11. 11. 11. Could you please repeat that? 11. Whose idea was this? You need to try an American accent. <laughs> right, so, and it, it's funny in that context, right? But imagine if this has to take place in like a car or something, or, you know, in a medical context, right? What if the language of the interface isn't your first language, right? What if you can't speak? <laughs> then you're, you're, you're locked out of using this thing. And if that thing, you know, if that product is critical to you, then, that, you know, it's not as funny as to Glaswegians in an elevator. Um, and AI can only recognize what it's being trained to hear. And we are the ones who train it. We dictate how it hears and how it learns. OK, there we go. Yeah, and this particular instance is of a parent weighing their child, their toddler. Uh, and their toddler was promptly encouraged to lose some weight. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, Airbnb's interface a while back allowed hosts to racially profile their visitors. Um, giving a rise to the hashtag uh, Airbnb while black. Uh, Noirbnb and Inclusive are two products that sort of, that were born to give minority groups access to these communities again. Next door is a social network uh, for neighborhoods and it allowed people to spread kind of unfounded paranoid racism through its reporting interface. Uh, the way people filled out the form allowed their racial bias to creep in. So this person reported someone as suspicious uh, because of and the underlining there is mine. Maybe it was how he was wearing his pants. So that's good. Um, uh, a couple more. Uh, FaceApp was a social media photo editor. And when you applied the hot filter, uh, it whitened and it whitened skin and changed nose shape. Uh, and this happened because the data set used to train that algorithm was composed of white people. Um, and, but again, it's not the algorithm's fault. It's, it was trained with, you know, someone composed that data set and thought it was enough, right? And the last two, um, a couple of years ago, Facebook only allowed people to select, select male or female gender. Uh, and Snapchat, more recently, had racist filters. Um, and you can see how these products create groups around them, but they aren't inclusive of everyone or they aren't inclusive of those whom it wants to help. And so all of these are implementation decisions made in the product process. They happen while we're making our product. And it happens on an individual level, like someone is responsible or the, or the whole team is responsible. Um, a design implies the code to be written or code constraints inform the design. And all of that manifests in user experience, right? And we're smart enough, we're smart people, we're smart enough to know what our code does or we're smart enough to find out. Um, and saying that's not my job is wrong. Um, we're, we're powerful in what we do. And part of that power is knowing how and when to use it. And quite often, I think these days, we're so consumed with getting something shipped that we forget to stop and think about it. But what's the point of shipping something if we actually fail to solve the problem, either entirely or for a good chunk of the population? So, yeah, exclusion is telling someone, essentially, with our product that they don't belong. Um, it's when our product, you know, um, fails to empower the people that it should. It does the opposite. And if we're really into actually solving problems, we need to care about this. Um, and it's, it is difficult because inclusive interfaces are often invisible because the barriers that might implicitly or, or otherwise uh, keep people out aren't there. But 
the lack of those barriers doesn't happen by accident. And so remember the definition again, right? It's not excluding any section or society of any party involved in something. Uh, so think about, you know, first and foremost, whether or not you're excluding people for whom you want to solve a problem. Like who should be empowered by it? And then if and when you build it, who does it empower, right? Who will have access? Does that match up with who should? And by considering all of our product design decisions in this community context, we'll be able to know how successful those inclusion efforts are. You know, and one bad decision may not break the entire, may not bring, excuse me, the entire product down, but they do add up. And so, you know, we've laughed at a few failures, right? But practically speaking, how do we actually approach doing this? Um, and it's, no, it's a hard problem, but in theory, we pride ourselves on solving those. Um, and this is just a new kind of problem to, to break down. You know, what does it actually mean for a product or, or a feature within it to be inclusive? And to understand that, we need to introduce this and bear, wi bear with me because we do hear and see this a lot. Like the word inclusion, this gets thrown around without being defined. And without definition, it has no power. But I think it's very simple. We all have it, so right, address it. And we do so by continually asking questions of ourselves and our own perceptions. And this is what we're good at, again, in theory, right? Asking questions. And it's always been a bit odd to me that inclusion and bias are never actually defined in terms of each project, right? If they're a requirement, like any other feature, then surely we should be able to break them down somehow. We should know what, again, quote unquote, inclusion means in our products context. Um, that is, who should be enabled and are they? Um, and, it's, and I believe that it's difficult because planning for inclusion necessitates not just breaking down a, a problem, but breaking down ourselves. It's breaking down our own capabilities and our own perceptions, and that's a lot harder to do than just looking at a feature. It takes longer, right? And so we don't bother because we're in a hurry. But we should try it anyway, I think. And first, we need to recognize this. And this might be a horrible, evil thing for a user experience designer to say, uh, because we pride ourselves on empathy and how to achieve empathy. And every day I see a Medium post about this. But um, there are some, I, I accept personally that there are some situations with which I cannot empathize. I, there will never, or maybe not never, I can't say that, but it's difficult for me to know what it's like to be a person <laughs> of color. How do, how do I go about doing that? I, I don't know, right? Um, and is there anything really that the men behind Health Kit, and they were all men, by the way, um, could have done to understand that they were missing out a key feature? Because it doesn't affect them. It doesn't occur to them that they should be able to track their reproductive health. Um, and that said, this doesn't mean that we can't help or we can't work on these things. It just means that we have to help a little bit differently. And so first and foremost, right, to know the limits of your empathy, you have to clearly understand the problem that you're, that you're solving. Then you should know if you, you, should be the one building it or working on it or making critical design decisions on that thing. And this takes a lot of introspection. It, it's difficult, you know, and can sound silly, but the answers to that question, are you the person who should be building this or making the decisions on this, it's hard to say no when our instinct is to solve problems and help people. Um, but it can help us understand, again, like I said, how to help. Um, and this, so this is the important bit. Getting inclusion right means giving something up. It means involving other people. So if you can't, if you recognize that you can't fully empathize with the problem and, the, and its nuances, and there are many, of, you can offer operational skills, right? We can offer our skills of, coding or designing or technical writing or what have you, uh, but leave the end decision making to someone else. Uh, someone who through and through understands the problem and the people who will be using and identifying with your product. Uh, right? So they will understand the nuances of it far better than, than you will. Um, 
And this is important as well, is that this doesn't happen after the product is, is built. Oh, let's get a focus group and get some user tests and it'll be great. No, because after all, if you get the problem definition wrong, then what are you building? Um, it either doesn't solve a problem for the right people or for anyone at all in some cases. And asking people to use a product assumes that one should have been built to begin with. Um, so involve these decision makers or these people. If they're not already part of your team, bring them in and involve them from the start. And again, like trust them. Again, they shouldn't just be there to provide an anecdote every now and then. They should be listened to and responded to in a meaningful way. If these people, again, part of your team or brought in from elsewhere, tell you that something doesn't work, make the change, uh, even if it doesn't feel right to you. Because again, if you can't empathize, if you're not the one for whom this should be solved, it doesn't have to feel right to you. It has to feel right to these people. Um, and again, you have expertise. It just maybe isn't in the details of how to track your reproductive health or what it's like to book, try and book Airbnb while black, right? But that doesn't mean you can't help. It just means that you can't make that critical design decision. And I think it's time to start pushing back against move fast and break things, especially in situations like this where details can be actively harmful to people. Um, and moving away from defaults, and th this has heard a lot, I think, in, in discussions of accessibility as well, is that moving away from defaults is unfamiliar at first, yes, but it's imperative to creating an inclusive user experience. And fine, we might be slower at it at first, but like any other process, we get faster at it as it becomes part of our workflow. And mistakes are fine, they're gonna happen. Um, you won't get everything right, and even when you do slow down, but when you, and when you do get it wrong, just don't offer an excuse, just fix it. It's okay, it's how you react that matters. And then the last step, remember this, okay? Um, sometimes when you try to design for everyone, sometimes you design for nobody and get no engagement. Focusing is fine. Uh, we think that if a product, we think that the only way for a product to be good is for it to solve a universal problem. But and that's okay, yeah, fine. But what if it solves a single problem for one deeply affected group really well? There's nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Um, and some quick examples of what this actually looks like when successful. Um, so Nextdoor, actually, you know how I mentioned this was, this was them before, this was a post on the neighborhood social network. Um, they, this was brought to their attention and they created a new posting process. They added friction to the user experience and that friction made users stop and think before they included information in their posts specific to race. And with these changes, a user is required to consider what they're posting about. Um, and if race is a part of their description, additional information is made mandatory. Right? So it slows them down. Completion rates on the form did go down, which is understandable when friction is added but the post quality goes up and the product gets better. And the folks posting probably don't even notice, right? but the effect is enormous. It means that someone isn't potentially arrested because of their choice of clothing that day. Right? Uh, Mobility Map is a collaborative mapping platform. Uh, it allows uh, folks with physical disabilities to be aware of areas that are impassable for them or difficult for them to pass through, and it allows them to plan their routes and journeys better. Uh, the designer behind this wasn't, wasn't herself aware of the nuances of the problem, but went into learning more about them. There's, um, I'll share afterwards on Twitter, I'll share like a list of uh, reading about this. The, their process on this was really cool. Um, Wayfinder, uh, this followed research actually done by the Royal London Society for blind people, their youth manifesto. It's an app which allows vision impaired people to navigate London's tube system. Uh, and this is a product which, again, to bring community back, it fosters a community for blind folks and it allows them to connect with a world in which, other pro in which a lot of other products exclude them just by design. And this one is really simple. Um, you may have seen the Medium post about it a while back. The hand holding the add to Slack button isn't a white hand. 
uh, this is a design and code choice that fosters an inclusive experience, right? People of color were appreciative of, in the, in the reaction to the, to the post itself, uh, of being represented in a world where white people are just the default. Um, and the, the medium post associated with this, just a brown hand, acknowledges the assumption that white people are the default, and it challenges that assumption. And if you can see the quote there, the small choices matter. Right? Like, like I said, it's not, you know, one may not bring you down, but they add up. And we can make them wherever we can. We can remember that slowing down, stepping back, understanding the community that your code creates can help make these decisions. And again, the, the previous post, it acknowledges the assumption that white people are the default. And it, it challenges the, the presence of that assumption. Um, success as inaction. And quite often, this is the most critical part of an inclusive user experience. I described it earlier as the lack of barriers. Um, it's not asking for what you don't actually need. You need to, you know, does your product need someone's gender or sex? You know, do you need someone's title uh, to know whether or not you should let them into the gym and change room? Um, yeah, well, yeah. So. Um, oh yeah, when it comes to notifications, do you need a loud one or do you need one at all? What do you need it for? Again, ask questions, keep asking questions of what you're doing. Um, uh, Gov.uk do a good job of this. Uh, their design manual indicates how just asking for title is a choice that matters. Uh, it involves potentially identifying information that might bar people from entry, which manifested in the pure gym example. Uh, quick recap here. I'll just, whoops. <laughs> My bad. Um, yes, so. Laying the right foundations here, it's about taking an honest look at your team, right? The people working on this. Are they the best people to solve the problem at hand? And if not, who needs to be there? What do they need? And this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but once we stop thinking about the products and think about the people behind them, the innovation will come, right? And I think therein is a little bit of magic. Um, it's about accepting responsibility, right? Because inclusion, again, once we define it, it's not some sort of like magical unicorn. It is something that can be broken down and features can be evaluated against it. Code and design decisions builds the micro and macro interactions that make for an inclusive interface. Um, and change begins at these foundations. We want to see technology as empowering people, but it's only true if those creating it do the same. Put the affected people first, accept our own limitations, and inclusion will follow. And only then can we start scaling. Okay? Thank you.